Hey everybody, good afternoon. This is Duffy Cooley coming at you with This Week in Cloud Native episode three. I'm glad you're here and uh, I'm really excited about this next episode. So let's dig into it, see what's happening this week. If you're here on the chat, go ahead and say hello. I'd love to, I'd love to, you know, see you here um, every week as we're going through this process. So I'd love to um, know that you're here. The only way I know that that's happening is if you're in the chat. So if you're here, check in. I'd love to see folks showing up here. All right. The next thing I have for you today is this page, which is kind of our weekly thing where we're going to keep, I'm keeping notes on, um, on stuff that is exciting that happens during the week or during the last two weeks uh, in cl cloud native space. And if there's anything that you would like me to cover, you can always just go to hackmd.io slash at TWICN, This Week in Cloud Native, and put in a note for me and I'll read it to you live on screen. And that's my plan for every week. So if that's so, if you see anything that's interesting, you can either just shout out to me on Twitter or you can put it in the HackMD notes and I will cover it every week in this episode. For this week's update, um, I wanted to talk about what's coming. Uh, let's see here. We have one of the changes that I saw on YouTube, which I was pretty excited about, was this one here where we have playlists and there are playlists for every show. And so if you want, if you missed your episode with Siam or with Maddie or <coughs> Leo, Leonardo or any of these other folks, you can go ahead and just either subscribe directly to that playlist or you can go back and watch what watch the, um, the episode that happened while you were away. But each of the channels seems to have their own playlist associated there. And that's pretty exciting. So there's new content every day of the week. Uh, <clears throat> this week, Tim Banks was hosting Sydney Miller, uh, one of the just incredibly awesome people in tech. And this is talking about Sydney's journey into tech and how she's helping uh, others kind of along that same path. Uh, Sydney works at Equinix Metal, and it was really a, I think it's a pretty good episode. It happened earlier today. Check that one out. Cloud Native Latinx with Leonardo Murillo, all about the community. We'll have best guests from various Latin American countries showing challenges, opportunities, and value in building a community in Latin America. Come check it out. Um, CNCF Face Off is kind of a game show hosted by Maddie. And if you're interested in, uh, you know, kind of participating in that, it should be super fun. And um, Matt Stratton will be hosting it. If you want to be a part of it, you can actually just follow this link and it will take you to a form where you can pick your team, what you want to, what, what you want that team to be called, all that good stuff, and 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 then participate in the show. And so I think that'll really be fun. Like I said, Siam's doing Search Magic, all about the different certified Kubernetes uh, certifications. We have Spotlight Live with Dan Pop. We have LGTM with Raw Code. He just did one on Prometheus, was really fun, kind of getting from idea to commit on that. 100 Days with Anais. <coughs> Anis and um, Cloud Native Classroom with Kat Cosgrove. I think she just did uh, Thanos, if I remember correctly. And then Fields tested with Kaslin. So definitely check those shows out. They're happening right here on Cloud Native TV. Feel, please subscribe to this show if you, I mean, to this channel on Twitch. You should see a subscribe button down around there somewhere and go ahead and click that button. Get notified whenever we're online. There'll always be something interesting happening. In the Kubernetes space, one of the exciting announcements is that this early bird pricing, which is about $650 off of the on-site pricing and $200 off the standard pricing is ending July 4th. So if you wanna get that pricing, get it done now. Um, you can save a bunch of money, <clears throat> either as a corporate or an individual, you can save you know not quite as much money, but you can definitely save a bunch of money. So definitely check that one out. So July 5th, the sale ends, July 5th. So definitely want to make that happen. One of the other commits I saw happen in the Kubernetes community this week, which I thought was pretty exciting to me anyway, was the Kubeadm now runs as not root. Um, and this is part of a cap, but let's take a look at the commit. This is kind of an exciting commit. So this is actually um, 
the cap right here. It's a bunch of work by Vinay. And what this represents is a change in the way that we operate the static pod manifests and other things run by KubeADM in such a way that they are significantly more secure. The running is not root. All of the capabilities have been dropped other than the ones that are necessary for that application to run. Um, and if you're interested in this work or you want to kind of read through what's happened or what the changes are, definitely check these issues out. I was thinking about for our playtime, I would kind of explore rootless KubeADM, but I don't think I'm, I don't think I quite have the right setup for that today. So I'm probably going to explore something else in that space, but maybe not that. Um, but maybe on the next episode, if I have a little bit more time to set up, I might set that one up because I'm actually kind of interested in seeing how that's going. Like, it's gonna, it should be a really fun one. <laughs> so, rootless kubeadm. That means, like, your control plane, your scheduler, your kube proxy, all of those components running rootless. And as a user, that is not root. And that way, if, for some, if by some chance somebody were to exploit one of those control plane components, inside of your cluster, they wouldn't be able to actually take over the cluster, which is actually pretty cool. Hey, we got people checking in. Let's see who these folks are. We got Samomi. Hello. Good to see you. What was Kind doing when running Kubernetes before? Ah, it, in Kind's project, uh, actually, in my, in my playtime, I'm going to show that. But the way that Kind was doing it was um, leveraging uh, just regular kubeadm inside of a root container. So kind in itself, under no circumstances, is to be considered like secure, right? Because like you're running privileged containers on your host that have that have significant privilege. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to like stand up containers and that sort of stuff. Now there is some change happening inside of the kind project that would enable rootless mode. In fact, I've seen one of the heroes of rootless. One of the heroes, no pun intended, of rootless mode uh, in the project working on just exactly that. Akihiro has been working on implementing rootless, um, rootless kind. So that'll be kind of exciting. And I imagine this work kind of overlaps or at least relates, but I haven't looked at it too closely yet. Pretty exciting stuff. But yeah, later on, I'm going to actually show like pulling the commit that is in review and then showing how to build that commit and then showing how to um, run that commit in kind. So we'll we'll take a look at how it's working in just a minute. One of the podcasts this week was a Kubernetes podcast 152 with Craig Box talking about SRE for everyone else. If you haven't checked out the Kubernetes podcast, it's probably worth checking out. It's a pretty decent podcast. They've always got some really good stuff happening inside of that space. Um, and then also uh, the recent TGIK, TGIK 158, was hosted by Nadir and Jason Didtebiris, who are good friends of mine who I worked with at CoreOS, or sorry, at Heptio. And they did a whole episode on Cluster API with Tinkerbell. So if you're interested in Tinkerbell or Cluster API or how to mash these words together, definitely check out that episode. It's TGIK 158. Now, one of the things I wanted to share with you is that a lot of the information that I get for the news every week, I get from here, right? And I'd love to get more information from you all as well. But what I get, what what I normally get my news from is things like Cube Weekly, which is a, um, a newsletter put together by my fellow ambassadors. And they gather things like headlines, what's happening inside of the, you know, the CNCF programs that are coming this week. We got a great uh, question by Emily Fox talking about the security tag, working on a serverless security paper, which will be a really interesting one. We have some technical papers, handling auth and EKS clusters, running HA proxy Kubernetes ingress controller outside of your Kubernetes cluster. How to build a Helm plugin in minutes and avoiding Kubernetes cluster outages with synthetic monitoring. I haven't looked at that one yet. That looks pretty interesting. But there's a bunch of different really great articles, including this one, which I th also thought about playing with, how to monitor Kubernetes costs with Lens IDE. If you haven't heard about the Lens IDE, it's another open source IDE for Kubernetes. Um, and it's actually pretty cool. So Justin, reminding us all that if you're going to be at the participant at the Contributor Summit, in, or if you're going to come to Los Angeles to be a part of KubeCon, 
and you want to go to Disneyland as part of that trip, you should definitely uh, join all of us together going to Disneyland. And we call it QB, we call it QB Land. We did this back in San Diego before the pandemic, and it was really a lot of fun. Um, but definitely, you know, if that's something that's interesting to you, check that out. He's got a form to add yourself. And there's no discounts or anything, but like it's a great way of like you know hanging out with pe folks in the community in a place that is totally unrelated to Kubernetes. And then we have the S S the editorial articles. Here's one that I pulled out, which was uh, Craig M Craig Box talking to Steve McGee talking about SRE for everyone else. Thought that was a really good one. Another article on CKA and CKAD certification. GitOps for RabbitMQ with Alexis Richardson. I mean, that's a really interesting one. RabbitMQ and GitOps. I'm, I'm surprised by that. I guess we'll see how that goes. Uh, it'll be kind of a fun one to play through. And then Alex Ellis wrote a book on Golang. And Alex is incredibly transparent about things that are happening. And so if you're curious about how that goes, like what he went through to write that book um, and how that's actually working, for, uh, working in the space or not, Definitely check that out. Like I think it'd be a, a good read if that's a, if that's something you're interested in. All right. Upcoming cloud native live, improving the Kubernetes experiencing, eliminating toil and tribal knowledge with Billy Cleek at uh, with Billy Cleek at DigitalOcean, and then an on-demand webinar again, talking about lens and that sort of stuff by Marantis. Pretty neat stuff. Uh, Kubernetes CVEs. I'm not sure that everybody knows about this uh, group, but if you don't know about this group and this is a space that you're interested in, you should know about this group. This is uh, just one of the many Kubernetes groups that are out there. This one is Kubernetes Security Announce. And every time there's a CVE or some other interesting thing that's being uh, fixed inside of Kubernetes related to security, you're going to see an announcement here that gives an overview of what it is, what the advisory is about, um, and and typically there may be and there may be some discussion related to that particular issue inside of the mailing list as well. So if you want to be a part of the uh, part of this mailing list, all you got to do is click on that link, the security announce group, and click join group, um, and then you'll be able to, you, you, you can kind of pick how often you get spammed. It can be on every notification. It can be a digest. It's up to you how you do it, but definitely a good one to watch out for if security inside of Kubernetes is something that you're, uh, that's on your mind. One of the other things from the community I saw um, is this uh, CNCF end user community providing insights into Kubernetes cluster management with technology radar. And so this is a pretty good article talking about like how folks are managing their Kubernetes clusters and what tooling and stuff. And uh, this is a pretty interesting one. And it's one of the first things I've seen come out of the, um, the user group around, you know, the CNCF user group um, uh, group. So I think that's a pretty good one. So definitely check that out if you're interested. And then it's playtime. So today for playtime, my plan was to set up an environment from scratch and find an issue that has not yet been merged, uh, something super simple, and, um, and then show how to build that commit and then test that commit according to what the issue describes. And and kind of work through that kind of end to end, right? So that was that was my goal for today. Kind of help you get your environment set up, work through like what it looks like to actually test a commit and show that the commit changes what it says it's going to change. And that was my goal. And I figure we can do that in about forty five minutes. But let's see what we can accomplish. So the commit I picked actually is like I said it was going for something really super simple. Oh, not this one. That's not a super simple one. There we go. So this is an open issue. And um, <clears throat> and it looks like this person had found a, uh, you know, a leftover word alpha in a command, a kubeadm help command. And went ahead and put in the fix, basically to remove the word alpha from the kubeadm help command. And what I want to show is how to actually get 
I mean, oh, first I kind of want to work through the UI here a little bit so we can actually understand like where this commit is in time or where other commits are in time. I want to show you that stuff. And then I'm going to show you how to set up an environment in which we can actually test that this commit changes what it expected to change. And this is a super, super simple example, but I think it'll give you the tools to test a more complex example if you choose to do so yourself. So first thing I wanted to show you was like uh, this page here. So if you, if you have a commit that's been committed, like this one here, it's been merged, right? Then what you can do is you can actually click on the commit link down here, which is the commit hash. And now you're looking at the actual commit that is represented inside of the code base. And one of the questions that people frequently ask is where in time is this commit, right? Is this commit, I mean, it's clearly been merged to master, but is it also part of a branch or a tag or anything else like that? And the reason I'm taking you to this page, right? If you look at the commit, you can actually see what branches and tags it is associated with, right? So right at the moment, it's on master and there, are, there is no branch, but it is associated with the tag V122 dash beta zero, which mean, I think is the top of tree right now. We could go look, but if you're ever wondering like whether a commit, if you've narrowed the problem that you have down to a single commit and you wanna see if that commit is part of a particular release or, or, or has made it or has been backported or any of those things, this is the way that you find that out, right? You can find the commit that you're looking at click on the commit itself, and then look down here in this description and it will tell you exactly where it is in time. So this has been committed to master and because it's been committed to master, it's also been committed to this tag. So let's take another one. Let's see, closed. Actually, you know what? It'd probably be easier to go with the actual commits, right? So let's take a look at this one so this commit is a fix to fix affinity node node port timeout and if we look at the actual commit we can see that it's actually just in master let's scroll down let's go like way down So here is another page that we've committed and we can see that this, oh man, I guess I, there's so many commits that happen like so frequently and so uh, and, and so on, in, in such an automated way that it's kind of hard to find one that is like, you know, historically relevant. Um, let me see if I can figure out a way to do this. What, oh, I have an idea. Okay, so if we go to Kubernetes and we go to command, kubedm, app actually let's go to Kubernetes. we'll do blame two years ago here we go so this commit was committed on 2019 and we can see down here below that we see a different output instead of showing us just the um just the top of tree branch or the top of tree tag we can also see that this commit was part of every tag from v118 alpha 2 all the way to current, right? And if we click on between, we can see this commit resides in each of the tagged versions from 118 alpha 2 all the way to 122.0 uh, beta 0. So this is a way of determining whether your commit, the one you're looking at, the one that has the source of all of your frustration, has actually been made it made it into a release or not right okay that's what i wanted to show you on the on the github ui and next up we're going to build this and we're going to test and see if it works and so i kind of want to so that'll involve setting up a build environment um, we're going to leverage kind for a lot of the build environment and we're going to go ahead and build kubeadm with this commit and i'm going to show you the, the i'm going to show you the before and after all right, so let's check this out. First thing I want to show you are, are two tools that I use a lot, right? The first tool I use a lot is a tool called Direnv. 
And what DRAM does, let's go on back here real quick. DRAM is a tool that lets you set environment variables. DRAM. Oh, dot net, my bad. This is the tool that lets you set environment variables when you move into a directory. So, and you're not in the directory, the environment variables are empty, but when you move into it, all of the environment variables that you have specified inside of your .nvrc are loaded into your environment. Now, this is super handy for different coding environments that you might be working in. So let's, like, let's just kind of do an example of, of why this is so handy here. So I'm going to do DRM edit dot. Oh, no, not in my home directory here. So make dear uh, Twicken. Twicken. Here I am in the, this week in cloud native. DRM edit dot. And this creates a DRM file, but there's nothing in there right now. So the next tool I want to introduce you to is one that we're going to use to go ahead and populate the configuration inside of here. We're going to use a tool called gimme-go. So let's take a look at that one real quick. Gimme. And there's lots of ways to do this. This is just the way that I've been using um, for this. And I, I kind of like it because it actually, it's pretty frequently updated and pretty well maintained because it's part of the solution stack at Travis CI. And so I'm actually pretty, pretty convinced that it will be around for a while. And that it's pretty reasonably tested, right? So Gimme Go is a bash script that sets the environment variables. Uh, it will go and fetch a version of Go for you and set environment variables such that it will leverage that fetched version of Go entirely within the, the, the directory that you've created or inside of your system somewhere. So if you're going to use Go in any kind of like containerized environment, this is a really great tool, um, but also even locally, right? Like we understand that like clearly Go changes versions faster than many of the uh, distribution package managers and stuff keep up with. And so it's, it can sometimes be difficult to like determine which one you want to use. Like Python has something like this that's called like pipm or something like that. And Ruby has uh, a, another one that's very similar, right? But basically a way of leveraging a particular version of Git, associating with that particular version of Git with a particular directory, and then making it so that that is now your Go development environment in which you're going to do all of your work. So in our case, I already have Gimme installed. And if you want to go ahead and install it, uh, I had it going to install. So I'm going to go ahead and grab it from the AUR repo. I'm going to drop that bash script right on my system. I'm going to do gimme stable forward uh, greater than dot mvrc. And what this will do is it'll just pop all of those environment variables right into this, right into my environment that I'm that I'm here in. So then I'm going to edit this. Theorem edit dot. So these are the environment variables that it set. It unset goose, it unset go arch, and then it went ahead and set um, export go root. And that's where the that's that's where the version of Go that is stable currently has been put. And then it added it to my path before everything else, making sure that that version of Go would be leveraged. And then um, gave me a, and then it ex exported a bunch of environment variables inside of this space, right? So let's take a look at that one. Let's go. Go 
Okay. Me and let's go one sixteen and so it's setting go root and setting go it's setting our path and this is basically just what it loaded in there right okay so next thing I want to do is I want to edit this and I'm going to go ahead and set my go path. Go path equals I'm going to set my go path to PWD, which basically means that, oh, you know what? I probably want to actually make a go deer, a go directory here. So theorem edit dot a go. All right. There we go. So now we're all loaded up here, right? We got our go path. We've got our go root. We've got all of the other things that we need. Let's go ahead and uh, check something out here. So what we'll do is we'll do go get uh, uh, sigs.k8.io slash kind. And by default, kind will actually grab the latest release. And it'll build it right here in our directory. So let's check it out. Let's go in and getting all of the dependencies. And if we move into go bin, there's our kind. And so this is just as as complex as it needs to be to build kind. It's pretty pretty handy. All right. So now we've got our kind environment, or we've got our kind binary. Let's make sure that that kind binary is in our path. So we'll do our nvrc again. Oh, path. And what I'm doing here is I'm just adding. The go pass binary directory or bin directory into um, before our regular path, and that way any bins that are in there are going to get loaded up, right? So let's go ahead and exit. And if I do dirm allow, and then if I do which kind, we can see that that's the version of kind that we're using. Pretty darn cool. All right. Next up, what we're going to do is we're going to check out the Kubernetes code base, and we're going to look at that commit. Uh, we're probably going to use like um, some some uh, GitHub CLI commands, or we could not. But I think I think I want to show you the GitHub CLI commands because I think they really make your the in your life a lot easier when working through this kind of stuff. Let me actually just make this a little bit bigger too, because I think maybe that's a little too small. Okay, that's better. Looks like we have a question. I want to jump over here and see what the question is. Once in DRMV and another in GIMIMV. Yeah, I know. It, looks, it does seem like a duplicate. So I wonder if there's like a catch in the fact that like maybe it's trying to determine the fact that it, that it is in an environment manager or maybe it doesn't know that or something. It does seem kind of like a duplicate. I'm not setting go root twice. I'm setting go pass and go root. And it's only setting go root one, one, the one time. So if I do echo go root, setting it to that. And if I look at the, um, yeah, I mean, it is setting it. Sorry, you're right. It is setting it twice, but it's setting it to the same value, right? It's setting it, um, which is weird. I agree. Because we are setting it here. And then it's also setting. I guess it's like maybe that was meant to be commented out because it's kind of catching both. Or maybe this is actually because this is gimme env and we're not referencing gimme env anywhere. This is just telling us where we got the environment variables. Yeah, I think that's it. It's only setting it once. It's only setting go root here. Now, if we had... I don't know if we had like eval 
dot gimme. I mean, we had email, email that path, then it would actually make it real, right? But we're not doing that. We're actually kind of highlighting where that content came from. All right. So we got that set up. Let's jump in. Let's jump in a little further here and play with this stuff. So we got our Go environment. Now the next thing I do personally uh, is I actually go ahead and check out with Go one Go one eleven mods off because I kind of want it to be under my source tree, um, and I think that might just be the way that I do it. I'm not sure that everybody does it that way, but let me show you what that looks like. get k8.io. Kubernetes. And you have to, when you're going to check out the Kubernetes source code, you have to use like the, um, the k8.io moniker. Like a lot of times if you're going to do something like this, you would normally do like go get like github.com slash username slash project. Um, and although you can do that with go get in Kubernetes, it messes it up because a lot of the paths inside of the code base require that uh, that, that they are importing from k8.io slash Kubernetes blah. And so if you don't have that path, uh, if you don't have the checkout in that path, then things get really weird and woogie and they don't work terribly well. And so when you're going through this, you definitely want to make sure that you check out the Kubernetes code base with go get kh.io slash Kubernetes, or your environment will not work in the way that you expect. It will be quite painful. So we can see that this checked out, <clears throat> and it's going to complain about no go files, because this is an automatic build. That would be kind of nuts. Can you imagine? You do go get Kubernetes, and it just builds the world. That would be a lot of, that would be a lot of work. So <laughs> that doesn't happen there. It works out OK for kind, right? But like for Kubernetes, nah. So it's moved it into go search kates.io.kubernetes. So if we move into that, so here's the source code for Kubernetes, right? And if I do git version or git remote dash v, you can see that my current upstream is the HTTPS version of upstream in, in GitHub. And now I want to add my fork to this, right? So I'm going to do gh for uh, repo fork. And it says, I already have a fork. Do you want me to add that remote? Yes. All right. So now I'm sitting on my own fork. And origin is upstream cube, right? So if I I can still check out tags, I can still check out the latest release, all of that stuff. But right now I'm sitting on my fork of Kubernetes. Now the first thing we're going to do in our test is we're going to see the break. We're going to see the thing that we're going to fix, right? So let's go ahead and do kind build node image name head. It's called image. And kind will automatically detect what the source is, uh, where, where, where your source is checked out. And then it will build based on what it sees here. Right. So I'm going to go ahead and build top of tree and hope it works. Um, otherwise, I might have to back out and do. Actually, you know what? This is probably a bad idea. Let's do this. Let's do kind. Let's do git. Check out V1. So currently, the top is 122.0, beta is 0. So let's check out alpha 3. And then we'll, do, we'll build it from here. Kind build node image. Image equals. Me to zero alpha three. 
So then the kind project is going to go ahead and build based on my code on my on my um, source code. It's going to go ahead and build this, and included as part of that build will be a number of different things. You can actually tell it where it is. Yeah. One of the questions was, can you tell kind to use where the source code is by any chance instead of using your go path? And the answer is absolutely yes. In fact, while that's building, I'm going to go ahead and bring up another window and show you that. Right. So if I do kind build node image help. Right now, it by default, it kind of auto detects it. But if you know where it is, then you can just specify dash dash cube root and give it a pass. I'll wait for that guy to build a little bit. My pleasure. While we're waiting for this to build, let's go back and look at that change that we actually I did introduce one other command. It was the GitHub CLI. And I wanted to kind of talk to talk to that guy real quick. So that's on cli.github.com. It's very handy. Like you can actually do things like pull a particular pull request. You can um, do all kinds of fun stuff like that, right? Basic so it's a pretty cool tool for this sort of stuff. It gives you it follows a pretty well described uh, GitHub flow, and so some of the stuff I've been playing with uh, in my dev environment really it, it works into my flow pretty well. While we're building things, let's take a look at what's happening on the system. So things are chugging along. Takes a minute to get everything built. I now are building a Docker image. Now, a lot of these steps that make this seem like it's going to take a really long time um, will take longer the first time. And then those images will be cached, right? And so you don't have to actually go through that like initial cost over and over again. The subsequent build we do of Kubernetes will be faster than, 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 than what we're seeing here. This is my new laptop from, from, from my work and stuff. It's actually pretty cool. What it's doing, um, it's a uh, T14S. So it's got an AMD laptop. It's got an AMD chip in it, a Ryzen Pro, <coughs> a Ryzen 7 Pro. So that means it's got 16 cores, which is very exciting. And I found one with 32 gig of memory in it. Uh, it's a pretty solid little ThinkPad. I'm actually really happy with it. The one that I had before this was a um, X1 Carbon. And it kind of suffered a little bit um, sometimes in like in, in doing work because and I think most of my biggest problems were related to the video card. Like the video card itself was actually kind of slow. And so because it was still the Intel chip, and so even all wired up correctly and everything, it still couldn't really cut something like the stream that we're doing here. Like it wouldn't be able, it just wouldn't have enough resources to like, uh, to make the video stuff work. With this, with the AMD chip, you get a Radeon built in. So it's very similar to like that Intel video card, um, but it's using, uh, it's using Radeon stuff. So it's actually pretty significantly faster comparatively. So I've not had nearly the same problems with this as I had with the old one. Pretty exciting stuff. I should have built before the show. It's taking us a while here. This tool that I'm looking at here is called uh, BPyTop. There it goes. Now we're getting somewhere. And what BPyTop does is it gives me a really, I think, really beautiful view of what's happening on the system. Right? I can see the processes that are running and how much and how much is being used by each process. I can see my a map of my CPU utilization. I can see map of my memory uh, graph. 
I want to see it simpler, more complex. I can see disk I/O and uh, my network info and my uh, network upload and download. So pretty cool stuff. It is. It's a. Yeah, we're big. I, I'm building. A, I'm building basically the top of tree for kind right now, and then I'm gonna pull a commit from um, upstream, and then go ahead and build that commit and show that the change that that commit represents has been changed. Um, yeah, I didn't put anything in the notes for what I was going to do today, but I should probably put that in there. That's a very good call out. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Russ. It's sixteen threads. <clears throat> um, See what is it? It's like eight. Is it eight core, sixteen threads? Let's cat rock CPU. Yeah. So eight cores and each with two threads. So pretty fast. I'm kind of digging it. It's working out really well for me. Got it really inexpensively on eBay too. So we're almost done with our build here. No problem at all. I'm glad you're here. And so there's all of our binaries that we're building, the API server, controller manager, scheduler, proxy. And this is the one we care about today, kubeadm. And the reason we care about that one so specifically is because we want to make sure that the change that we're making to kubeadm shows up as a change in the system. Well, you can see it is busy time now. We're at like 97% CPU. And I can actually kind of tell video wise, I'm still suffering a little bit. I wonder how it looks all to you, how it looks to you all. I mean, this is a, a fully saturated CPU at this point. I hope I'm still I'm still I hope I'm still here. It seems like I am. Quick we're almost done with the build. A Pi 4. I mean yes I think I think that you can leverage kind we're, we're gonna, if, as long as you can put kind there, then you can use kind to build your, your source code, right? Um, and I'm pretty sure, although, like, I mean, maybe we should just go look, because I'm actually kind of curious about that myself. So kind arm, not arm 53. What is that about? Kind, that's sigs.case.io. Do, do, do. Survey says closed. Why is it closed? Did it get worked? So there are people who have used it to build kind. Hey, there we go. Kind of head should just work on ARM64, but we need verification. We have a report of it working here on Apple Silicon. Yeah, so 11.1 and 11 should just work. So I, I would say give it a try. Great question. This is the question I'm responding to. Would this work for Pi 4, or would you, would you recommend cross-compiling? And uh, I think it would work. So pretty cool. I've not tried it, um, but I don't actually have uh, I don't have a res I don't have a pie to play with. But I, I think with, I think that uh, with a lot of folks like moving toward the um, Apple Silicon Max and stuff, there are going to be more people playing with this stuff, and so I would expect that it would continue to work.
Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Coming to the end of our build, it looks like. CPUs are beginning to cool. We're going to make one more build like this with this change in it. Um, but first, I want to kind of like evaluate the change, look at it, get it into our code base, and then we'll validate that it, the change is there. All right. There we go. Okay, so now if I do kind create cluster image equals uh, I guess I could have named it something easier to type. And what we've done here is we basically just leveraged kind as a kind of a build environment for everything where I don't, I'm not building anything by, by hand. I'm just actually just leveraging kind to do the build itself. And then I can go ahead and verify that the change is there or not. As a reminder of the change that we're talking about here, let's go ahead and bounce back here and look at this change. This is the, here we go. So this is a change to kubeadm, and it's updating the kubeadm help message to get rid of the alpha certs uh, line. Right? So if I docker exec in here, I do kubeadm help. Where is the bug at specifically QADM alpha help? Ah, QBDM, that's where it is. QBDM search. I'm not catching it. Where is the bug? QBDM alpha search generate CSR. The following command. Oh, generate CSR. So it's probably the generate CSR command. So. Oh, that's deep. Generate CSR. Found it. All right. So here, like we can tell it's not an alpha command, right? It's kubeadm certs, kubeadm certs, generate CSR. And then the help output is the word alpha. And so this is the thing that the person opened the issue to fix. And so now we're going to go ahead and check that code out, make sure it changes the thing that we want it to change, and then build again and, and show that it works. And using this technique, you can actually test much more complicated things. but it just seems like a pretty good way, a pretty good flow for testing things that, you know, in, in your environment. So let's go ahead and check this out. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do GHDR 
out. We're going to grab the pull request. I don't remember the pull request number, though. So the pull request was, oh, it's already been merged. Just actually just got merged. It's 103249. So while we were on this show, this PR got merged. That's the right one, though, right? Okay, so now we're on the update QBDM help message, and we'll do git checkout C122 alpha 3, which is the one that we were on before. And we'll do git checkout dash B C122 alpha 3. We have a pretty name for it. And then what I want to do is I want to merge from that branch that I had here, the update kubeadm help message, right? So git diff that. Oh, there's a bunch of changes there. So git check out. Log. This is the commit in specific that I want to change, right? So if I do git show, this is the only commit in there here. So now we're going to do git checkout back to our, our, our source code that we checked out before. And then I'm going to do git cherry pick. In our commit message. Now, what's interesting is what's happening is that I have all of these commits in this huge library of commits on my system. Because I have checked out that uh, pull request, I can now put the commit from that pull request anywhere in time, anywhere on any branch that is local in my environment. So what I've done is I've gone ahead and pulled that commit and put it on top of the branch that we built our original kind node image on, right? So now if I do git uh, log, I can see here is the commit that was made, right, to correct the example of kubadium help. And this was the commit for the tag that defined it, or, or this is basically where the tag was defined. V1220 alpha 3 is sitting at this particular tag. And so now I have enough to go ahead and build again and prove that my change shows, right? So if I do git show I can see the change. There it is. It's in my code base. And so my next step would be to build again and then show the change that we showed before, right? So I'll do kind build node image image equals fixed. Actually, let's go ahead and Use the PR for that. Why not? Right? Kubadium fix. Now, it shouldn't take quite as long to build all of this. Actually, I think I just did. I just added a branch name, so likely that reset the the cache. But if you didn't actually, uh, actually, no, I added a commit, so it's a new cache. And so it will, it has to rebuild from scratch, um, but it won't hopefully not take as long. Oh, there we go. Sync and source is in. Our build container is still there. Running the build command. Let's go ahead and look at the, look at things work again, like we saw before. And then there's one more thing I wanted to show you which I think will also help, but it'll be just a second while we get this thing set up. Hi, Top.
So the next thing I wanted to show you after this is all over is how to run tests kind of inside of the same kind of build environment, which are pretty cool. So if you're going to use Kind as a build environment, uh, one of the questions that sometimes people have is, if I'm going to leverage that as a kind of build environment, how do I run tests against uh, the code that I'm working with kind of like at build time or before build time? Like, can I do unit tests and that sort of stuff? Um, like, where is the code checked out and can I still do unit tests? And I'll show you a couple of different ways to do that. But we're going to go ahead and let this build. We can see already that this build is way faster than the other build was, right? Because we already have our build container, and our build container is kind of in a fixed set. Of, uh, it's associated with a particular uh, um, period of time for the Kubernetes code base. And so as long as we're still within that same time, we don't have to build another build container. We can leverage that same build container that was already built, right? With that particular version of Go, with those particular sets of tools, all of those things remain consistent between our two builds. So we didn't have to like generate a new build container that would create that stuff. Um, but we are building all new binaries with our change. And at the moment, we're building all of it, right? Because we're testing all of Kube with Kube ADM, with Kube Kettle, with the API server controller manager scheduler, all that stuff, right? And so because we're doing that, we're getting a pretty complete view of whether this change actually messed anything up for any other component within this distributed system, or whether it's actually, uh, or whether it's literally just a change in docs. And we can look from the code that it is just a change in docs, right? We don't need to actually build all, all of the world for this. But as an example, what I'm walking you through here is kind of showing you what it looks like to build all of the world for this, and then use that new environment to prove that your change works. So say you were making a change to like, I don't know, you're making a change to that rootless uh, configuration that we talked about before. And the way that you did it is you had to add a particular security context capability for, uh, you know, sysnet bind or something inside of the uh, API server. How would you verify that the fit, that the change you made to the manifest for the static pod manifest was, was, was correct? Like, how could you, how could you verify that? And that's, this is definitely one way to go about making that sort of a change. Another example of a change like this was, I remember there was a bug in IPVS and somebody uh, patched that bug and they were showing, and I was working with, um, and I was showing how to verify that. So if you wanted to kind of dig more into like that use case, uh, I wrote it up as a blog. In fact, all of the thing I'm covering here is written up as a blog. And Nope. Using kind to test a PR for Kubernetes. And so this was actually showing how to leverage DRM, Gimme, and this whole environment to go ahead and do the sorts of testing that we're doing here um, live inside of this environment. And exactly why to change and how to check out the code, how to check out the branch, and how to verify that the thing works and this is all right here the same thing i'm actually covering in my doc is all right here and so i'm going to actually go ahead and put this into this document And that will describe what we've made, what we've done today. So this we're pretty close to done. We're at the top of the hour. So I'm gonna shut it down here as soon as this build is done and we show that it works. I'm gonna go ahead and end the episode. So thank you both for signing in. I hope there are other folks out there. If you're out there and wanna say hello, say hello. Give me a wave.
Good to see you all. And I look forward to doing this again in two weeks. And we'll do more kind of tips like this and kind of explore different things like this um, going forward. QBDM fix is my image name. All right, node build, node image is built. Yeah, for me, I mean, like when I, if I'm doing any development for the control plane or any of that, do you mean like, do you mean the code base itself? Like if you're going to modify the controller manager or modify the API server, that kind of stuff? Or did you mean something else? I'm curious about your question. I create cluster image equals medium. Yeah. So the so debug test cycle. So if you're, if you can actually, you know, this is a pretty quick loop for, for building again and again, if you're making changes to code and you want to prove that it works. Um, alternatively, what you could do is actually, um, I have seen examples of folks leveraging uh, other tools. And in fact, there's a great example of this in cluster API of leveraging other tools to do kind of a faster break loop fix model um, for how this works. But in this particular test, if you know what you're changing and you want to actually, you know, you made it past your unit tests and you're ready to actually like validate that your change works, this is one way to go. Um, and because it's kubeadm, you can actually modify quite a lot about this. You can turn on debug, you can turn on lots of different stuff. So let's docker, let's jump in here. Medium fix control plane, bash, medium, certs, CSR, help. Generate CSR. And now we see there is no more alpha. So the change absolutely did make the change that he was expecting. And it looks good. And that is our episode for today. But yeah, I mean, that's a good point. And maybe what we should do is what I'll do next is I'll actually kind of show how that might work if you were going to make a change to something like that. But thank you both. Have a wonderful time. And I'll see you next time. See you next, uh, see you in two weeks. I hope you all have a wonderful time.